How many of you know John 11:35? What is it? And it is depends on which Bible you use. You knew that was coming, right? Somebody had to say it, right? John 11:35. Those of you who were confirmed a long, long time ago when you had mean, evil pastors that made you stand up in front of the congregation and get questioned and have to spout forth all of the stuff that you've learned, right? No, the, their pastors weren't mean and evil. They were just doing it the way that everybody else had done it. And things have kind of changed a little bit. But you still had to stand up in front of the congregation and do a verse, right? And if you got to pick your own verse, how many of you wanted to pick John 11:35? Because it's short, right? It's easy to remember. We can all remember Jesus wept. But that's actually not what, if you read the reading that we had this morning, the NRSV does not translate it, Jesus wept. It translates it, Jesus began to weep, right? But even in the King James Version where it is Jesus wept, it's two words that is, I, I have it written down here. It's not the shortest verse. It is not the shortest verse in the Bible. The verses for generations have thought that 11.35 was, but it's not because... It has three words and 16 letters in the Greek Bible. Jesus wept. It has three words, 16 letters. 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Does anybody know what 1 Thessalonians 5.16 is off the top of their head? Only has two words and 14 letters in the Greek. So therefore, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 is actually the shortest verse in the Bible. So, there's your, there's your party trivia for the day. What is it? I'll have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting here because Jesus wept, or Jesus begins to weep, is the verse that we all remember, right? Now here's the most interesting thing to this, to me. The word here for weep, it's not the same word that was used just the verse prior, right? Because it says Mary was weeping and the Jews that were with her were also weeping. And then it says, and then Jesus wept. It's a different word. Does that mean that John is telling us that Jesus is weeping is different from the weeping in the morning of those who come before him? Is Jesus is crying here something different than the crying that each one of us does? when someone we love has passed? And then we get to the interesting question. Those gathered around, some of them say, look, he, look how much he loved this man because he's also crying. And then some of them ask, could not this man who cured the blind have kept this man from dying? There's two things to this question that are, that are relevant to us today and something that we all should take from this. Number one, the Jews that were there may not have actually believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but they saw in Him power to do things that were beyond the strength of mortal, regular men. Right? Because they realized that He had cured the blind man. He did that back in John chapter 9. He cured the blind man. He gave someone back their sight. So they recognize Jesus has ability over and above what they do. But I don't think there's any instance in the Bible and John anywhere prior to this where Jesus has kept someone from dying. And it's not there even after this. Jesus does not keep people from dying. That's not what you want to hear this morning, is it? The news is, you're mortal, and you're going to die. It's not what we want to hear. But nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever keep anyone from dying. Nowhere in the Bible does Jesus ever keep anyone from suffering. Look at the believers. I got Kurt thinking. 
Did the believers have an easy life, is what I mean by that. Did all of the people who followed Jesus and did everything that he asked them to do and followed after him have a life walking through a rose garden with no issues and no problems whatsoever? No. Jesus does not keep bad things from happening to us. That's not why he came. That's not why God sent him. You see, the promise isn't that Jesus will keep us from dying or suffering. The promise is that Jesus is going to resurrect us. Yes, we're all going to die a physical death in this life. But the promise of God for us to hold on to and that we cling to on this day when we remember all of those who have gone before us, that at some point we will be with them again, standing around that table, sitting around that table at the great banquet feast with God in the new heaven and the new earth. Because death is not the final answer. There's a promise that bridges the gap and goes over death. So Jesus walks up to the tomb, they take him up, and they say, and there's a stone laying in front of it, and he says, take the stone away. And Martha says, Wait a minute. you don't want to move that stone, Jesus, it stinks. Right? Because he's been in there how long? Four days. And what does that mean? I've said this before, but there's new people here now, so... Does anybody remember the four days? He's really dead. That's what that means. That four day thing means he's really dead. The Jews in Jesus, they believed that for three days the spirit or the soul would hover over the body and that the person could wake up in three days' time. How many of you ever heard the term dead ringer? You know where it comes from? They used to have to tie a string on people's fingers because they'd bury people alive. And if you heard a bell ringing in the graveyard, you knew somebody in the ground was alive. So you needed to go find which bell was ringing and go dig it up. That's a dead ringer. And, that, and Jesus, so he comes four days. Because he knows if he came back in two days, right, Lazarus really wasn't dead. If he comes back in three days, Lazarus really isn't dead. But in four days, Jesus comes back, and they say, take the stone away. And Martha's like, we don't want to, man, it's going to stink, Jesus. We don't want to move the stone because he's been in there and he's dead. But Jesus says, remove the stone. And then he prays. Right? Where does the miracle happen here? Jesus, as they roll the stone back, and he gets the smell, and he prays to God, and what does he say? I thank you, God that you always hear me because, yes, I know you always hear me, and you sent me here to show these people how we're supposed to live. And he prayed to God not for his own sake or for the sake of Lazarus, but he prayed for those who were standing there that they might hear him. Kind of like what happens right here a little bit later when we say those words in the night in which he was handed over, our Lord and Savior took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. It's not for us. It's a thanksgiving to God that we get to overhear Jesus prayed so that the people around would know that God sent him because it's important to know where he comes from. And then Jesus yelled, right? Jesus krodzoed. He yelled. It's interesting, this word krodzo is used in three places in the Gospel of John. Once here in John chapter 11. Once in John chapter 12. Does anybody know what happens in John chapter 12? I was going to be impressed there for a moment. (laughs) I'll give you a hint. It's coming in March this year, where we get things and we wave them around in the air. Palm Sunday. The crowd shout out, Hosanna. They crotzo Hosanna. And the next time this word is used is in John chapters 18 and 19 which is when they call for him to be crucified. We have Jesus using the word, shouting out, Lazarus, come out! It had to be loud enough to wake the dead, right? I mean, he was dead, so he had to shout really loud. And the other two times are for Jesus, when they're shouting, Hosanna, because we want you to save us. And the second time when they're calling for his life, But he yells at Lazarus to come out of the tomb, and my question is, it's never been answered, did Lazarus have a choice to listen or not? Who 
would he have just laid there and not listened? But he gets up. He comes out. Lazarus is dead. He can do nothing for himself. All he can do is receive whatever God is going to give to him, whatever the power of God is that's going to come to him. It's that call of faith, the call to die, that God's power might live in and through us and work in and our lives. And theologically, we believe we died when we came to that font. As we gathered around that font with our parents and our sponsors and whoever else was there, we're buried with Jesus in his death and rise up out of the waters. A new life. We believe that we died at that day. Theologically, we die in our baptism and we die daily when we repent and we do confession. When we have confession at the beginning of each service, we die and rise again in new life because of the power of God. But we know that sometimes we don't always stay there, right? It doesn't stick. I'm rubber, your glue bounces off me and sticks to you, right? It doesn't stick to me. Let's hope it doesn't work that way. But sometimes it doesn't stick, right? We go back to the old ways. We do old things, signs of our old lives. We keep ourselves bound by the things that we do and upholding the things that we think are going to be good for us. Because that's the true miracle in our gospel lesson today. Jesus calls Lazarus forth from the grave. He comes out and he's bound. He's got strips of cloth around his arms and his legs and around his head. And Jesus says to the crowd, unbind him and let him go. Because even God's miracles requires your help. Even the most miraculous things sometimes need our assistance. Now don't get me wrong. God doesn't need our help to do anything. But God uses each and every one of us to do His will and to work His wonders here in this place. Because think about it for a moment. The feeding of the 5,000. Who actually did all of that work? Jesus didn't make a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken just appear at the feet of every family. Right? Or a fish dinner would be more appropriate, I guess. He didn't just make a perch dinner just show up at their feet, Right? with all of the fixings. Somebody had to walk around with the bread and the fish that he blessed and broken and give to all of those people. It took manpower. It took the disciples to walk around and do that. Our own denomination's motto is God's work, our hands. Because we believe that we are messengers of God. We are sent here by God to do His will and His work in this world. And He works in and through each and every one of us to make those things happen. So my questions for you today, as you know that you are the hands and feet of God, sent to go out into the world to deliver His hope to everyone, what would you do? Or how would your life be different if you were dead and then came back to life. I wonder how Lazarus' life was different after being called out of the tomb and released by the community, accepted back in by them. Were his priorities the same? Did he work less or spend more time with his family? Could you imagine what life was like for Lazarus and then apply it to your own life? Because here's the good news. You have already died and rose again. God gave you new life when He met you at that font. And God gives you new life each day as you remember who you are and walk in His path and in His light. So you've been given a new life. What are you going to do with it?